1077 The Bronx and 1077thebronc.com proudly ranked the best college radio station in New Jersey by the New Jersey Broadcasters Association. Live from the Killarney's Public House Studios, welcome everybody to the Political Roundup. I am Tommy Franks, and it is Monday today, 406 in Lawrenceville. So, the news on uh, Friday, I was expecting to talk about a lot of other stuff involving uh, the new Congress coming in, things like that. But on fr late Friday night, uh, before I went to sleep, I saw the news that George H.W. Bush had passed away around 11.30 last night. It was being uh, widely reported. That was sad because um, he was he's a man that that is very respected he was you know someone I someone you can admire for for who he was now you don't have to agree with everything he's done which obviously I wasn't alive for but if you go back and study those policy um, the policies he's enacted he's he, you don't have to agree with everyone but he definitely had pride for the country and he definitely had he definitely had the, the right mind as far as putting, bringing the country forward. But that doesn't come from everybody. You hear the media talking about H.W. Bush in positive ways. And you hear everything, you know, the greatest things about him. So I took the, I took the um, New York Times report from uh, his spokesman, I believe, his, uh, James Baker, or Peter Baker, sorry. And he actually wrote an entire report on this in the New York Times, uh, who is very close to H.W. Bush, a very close friend of his. And he wrote, quote, George Bush had been fading in the last few days. He had not gone out of bed. He had stopped eating, and he was mostly sleeping. For a man who had defied de de multiple death threats over the years, it seemed that the moment might finally be arriving. His longtime friend and former Secretary of State, James Baker, arrived at his Houston home on Friday morning to check on him. Mr. Bush suddenly grew alert, his eyes wide, op his eyes wide open. Where are you going, Bake? He asked. We're going to heaven, Mr. Baker asked. That's where I want to go, Bush said. Thirteen hours later, Mr. Bush passed away. The former president died in his home in a gated community in Houston, surrounded by several friends, members of his family, doctors, and minister. Um, and then he, he, had, he had phone conversations with all his children across the country who were traveling, uh, George W. Bush being one of them. Uh, the last words he, sa was, he said was to his own son, D uh, W. Bush, saying, I love you too, in a uh, final exchange. It's sad. And this, and now the media is telling you how great he was. But the media were the exact same people that that bash this person when he was when he was debating and going for president and vice president. He was a congressman. Uh, this is this is common. I'm going to read you a couple articles that I read today. Kind of kind of uh, disgraceful. So one came, one came from Franklin Fuhrer over the Atlantic. And he basically suggested that H.W. Bush was not a man of courage, and it was, and uh, this is the, this is how the opposition will, will really tell you how they feel about Republicans and H.W. Bush. He said, "Quote: Obituaries present George H.W. Bush as the last of the Republican moderates. In reality, he was an arch archetypal re representative of the modern party, a man whose sense of duty failed him when it came to resisting the rise." of racially re rev revincent libertarian forces. He embodied an establishment that wrote very nice thank you notes, but good manners are hardly the same as moral courage. Prudence is sometimes very hard-hearted. Hard Those who are mourning the passing of the old establishment should mourn its many failures too. Wow. Um, this is literally two days now, or a few days after his passing, so truly unbelievable. But it doesn't stop there. An article in Vox, uh, a very a left-leaning publication to say the least came from one came from Laura McGann here's what she says I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of briefly talk about what she said here's, here's what she says um, for one thing she says the Thomas quote the Co Thomas confirmation battle referring to Clarence Thomas battle could have been a turning point in American history one where women's rights in the workplace and in the public square vaulted forward instead Bush chose to, chose to side with a man who multiple women described harassing them he sent a message to America that women should not be believed that article was published less than 24 hours after he passed. If that's the first thing that comes to your mind, how vicious, how hateful do you have to be? I'm sorry, but you know, I want to. You got to look up to the man, and you got to look at how you got to look at the positive in, positives in his life. And we can talk about that subject a little later on, and we can debate it. Sure, that's fine. I'm open to that. But the idea that we start attacking him like that a man who just passed 
literally less than 24 hours before that was written. That's the first thing you think of. Gee, I'm going to write an obit. I mean, think about it from, from the writer's standpoint. I'm going to write an obit, and I'm going to talk about H.W. Bush, and I'm going to, what do I think of first? You don't, you normally you think of the positive, right? You would think to write a good thing about H.W. Bush and the things that he did well with his family, he was a good family man, things like that. No, they stood to, um, oh, uh, he didn't think women would be, would, um, should be believed and all this stuff. Now let's have that discussion, but not in this setting. Disgusting. Just considering the timing of all of it. I'm not, I'm not, to be clear, I'm not bashing the, the talking point she's making. I am, I am criticizing the fact of the timing of her writing. It is very soon to do that. Now, this is, this is pretty convenient because this is as far for, for the opposition to do this as far as the Democrats, because this is how, um, if you remember how John McCain passed away, another honorable American patriot who served this country honorably, he passed away and the media told you he was great and amazing and all this stuff. Meanwhile, the media in the, in the past were telling you that he was a warmonger and, the, and a neocon and he supported wars and all this stuff. John McCain's funeral, if you remember, uh, turned, in, turned into a big bash of the President of the United States. Indirectly. You had Obama go out there, you had Meghan McCain go up there, his daughter, and the only person who basically didn't bash the President of the United States was the Vice President, who went and spoke. This is absolutely shocking how how the, and it's typically Republicans that get treated this way, if you look both sides, as far as like deaths and things like that, and who uses these for political advantages. I mean, you can look at Wallstone Memorial back in the past in Minnesota. That was a major, um, it turned from, it was supposed to be a, a memorial for a death, I think, of a senator, and it turned into a political rally to elect Democrats. Amazing. So there is major hypocrisy on this. And John McCain got the same treatment that George H.W. Bush did. Of course, they were far different times as far as when they were serving in high positions. But George H.W. Bush got treated very negatively when he was in public office. And if you look at some of the... You, you, he was a great guy because you look at some of the footage from the past of how he heroically served this country, you would think, oh, he's... And even, I think, um, his opponent in... Uh, what year was it that he was campaigning? 19... Was it 1988? 88? Yeah, and his opponent, the opponent, like, yeah, we're not going to win to this guy. He's, because he, he's heroic. He's got, he's, he's very honored based on his service in the military and his, and his public life. So you don't have to agree with everything he says. Certainly not. Certainly not everything he did. I don't. But do we hold that against him personally? No. No. He had the right intentions for the country. And he's getting attacked uh, from Vox, of all people. And, and the Atlantic now. Those are the two only... Oh, the AP wrote one, too, about um, something about him. I, I don't have it on me right now, but, but these two articles from Vox and the Atlantic were the most, most vicious, in my view, of H.W. Of, uh, Bush. And the hypocrisy here is incredible. And it seems to be that the, the opposition uses, the, uses the, these deaths for either political advantage against the president like John McCain and now with H.W. Bush. And it's incredible. And if you remember, not a politician I'm referring to here, but Charles Krauthammer passed away over the summer. And do you remember how that went? Joe Scarborough went on Twitter and quoted him for, a, for an attack on Trump because of something that Charles Krauthammer said. This was literally less than 24 hours after he passed. He tweets that, and I'm going to have to find that um, during the break. And then I'll read it, but that is that that was another point where where people who do not like Republicans end up using quotes and using using these deaths as political motives. It's truly sickening. All right, that's enough of that. So, moving on, Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to lying. This was a interesting story to say the least, because now he lied to Congress apparently about I think uh, some. Something about um, not campaign finance. He he pleaded guilty to campaign campaign finance law, but I'm trying to remember now. Oh, it was the for the Trump Tower in Moscow thing, and the and the contradiction of the story. Apparently, that's what Mueller is accusing him of. So now he's pleading guilty, and 
and no idea what he's going to serve for that. But looks and Trump's saying he wants he wants the the, the quote rat locked away for a long time. <laughs> Anyone who stays away from Donald Trump or or flips on him is considered a traitor in his view, and is supposed to leave. Okay, that's fine. And Michael Cohen pleading guilty is just another sign of more to come in this investigation. I think, I don't know if I'm wrong per se about, about how the investigation will finish out and when it will. Looks like it's going to be going a lot longer than, than I expected. It already has gone far longer than I expected. I thought this would be done in a year. No, this has been going on almost two years now. And I don't, I don't see it ending really because Mueller's, Mueller's got this now to, to look at. He can look at, but if you look at, if you look at every everyone that's been tried and and convicted or pleaded guilty to, they're political. They're political small crimes, right? Right. These are yeah. They're all small crimes. Manafort, for example. Yeah, he's got some shady dealings with WikiLeaks apparently, but even so, that has nothing to do with the Russian government tampering with votes and seeing if Donald Trump was involved. I don't see any evidence. Do you? Jake Tapper says there's no evidence on CNN. Every, every, a lot of people in the media can tell you, yeah, there, there's a lot, there's a lot there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of shady people that were around Donald Trump. We learned that very well. Manafort and Cohen, two of them. But the idea that, that there's evidence that that makes evidence for, for a potential collusion or conspiracy against the United States with the Russian government to influence an election for their benefit. I don't see it. That's absurd. How can how can anyone see that and, and say that's that's proof of collusion? And you have to be a fool. You got you got to look at this deeper. And and the idea that that Donald Trump colluded with the Russians. And if you look back in Shattered, Amy Parnes wrote this book. I read it front to back. She wrote a book with, I think, uh, what was the guy's name, John Allen or something like that, The Hill Writers, and they wrote a book detailing Hillary Clinton's candidacy, and they talked about the 2016 election and inside her campaign, everything that went on, and in it, they detail at the very end of the book that Podesta, who, is, who was the campaign chair for Hillary Clinton, and Robbie Mook, one of the managers, one of the, uh, the leading spokesmen on the campaign, very high senior position on the campaign, they were both planning out after Hillary, after it was known that Hillary was going to lose the Electoral College, that they planned on saying, okay, Russia is, Russia is the reason we lost, and that Trump was involved. That's where this charge came from. And to go back, this wouldn't have gotten any traction until Comey started looking into it, and then Trump fired Comey, which was recommended by the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, who then which then apparently gave gave way to opening a special counsel. That's why Mueller's there in the first place, is because Comey got fired. If Comey didn't get fired, we wouldn't be here right now. We wouldn't be talking about a special counsel. I mean, sure, you'd be talking about Democrats uh, pushing for investigations left and right. They said they came up with about 83 investigations for the president that they can go after. I think it was 83, somewhere around there. Hey, yeah, that's fine. Go, go after him. That's fine. But we wouldn't be talking about a special counsel if it, if it weren't for firing if, for the firing of the FBI director, which was a recommend, recommended memorandum by Rod Rosenstein. Incredible. So that's, it's, there's still no, like, there's a lot of shady people, just to summarize, there's a lot of shady people in that campaign, but do we have evidence of collusion, necessarily? The answer is still, after one year and eight months, the answer is an infatment, no. So, this also coming, speaking of the Clintons, they were at an event, and they're doing their tour right now. They're trying to see who still supports them and things like that. To do that, they're going on these tours and seeing who fills the, the, uh, the arenas. So they went to Air Canada Center in, in uh, Toronto, uh, Ontario, in Canada. So, when they went there, it was, I think, about 3,000 people that attended this event. And it was very small, and the seats, there were a ton of empty seats, more empty seats than when the Maple Leafs were not a great hockey team at all, which is, which is also astounding. Maureen Dowd, talk, uh, Maureen Dowd, apparently, from the New York Times, paid about $177 for a ticket, 
inside to the place. This was a, a little while ago, I guess. Guess how guess how cheap the tickets were <laughs> before the um, the day before the event. It's like seventeen dollars. It's cheap, ten to twenty dollars, because they needed to sell tickets. And the Clinton and this indicates that the Clintons are starting to fade away. Bill Clinton getting caught up in this whole Me Too thing, and Hillary Clinton just fading out of the spotlight. Progressives are taking over the Democrats, and Hillary will start looking more and more like a centrist every single day. And the Clintons are looking more and more irrelevant by the day, which is crazy considering now who's controlling the Democrats, some Clinton allies, but now you got progressives taking over the communication, the narrative. They're starting to take away, they're starting, the Clintons are losing power day by day. Okay, when I come back, I talked about tariffs last week at the end of the show. There is now a new negotiation, and it's partially why the market's fini are finishing up. It's going to finish very shortly. The market's closed, actually, 20 minutes ago. We'll talk about the market closing and, and why the market closed because of the tariffs. And Michael Avenatti, all of a sudden in trouble from his presidential run, possibly. More on that and more. When Keep it here, 1077 The Bronx and 1077thebronc.com. 1077thebronc and 1077thebronc.com. Live from the Kalani's Public House Studios. Welcome back, everybody. Forgot to mention, by the way, at the top of the hour, that you can email the show at thepoliticalroundup at gmail.com. I always forget that. So there's some big news that came on Saturday. It came from um, the G20 in Argentina. President Trump and, and uh, Xi Jinping of China have agreed to a, a truce in the tariff trade war, so to speak, you remember from last week that I talked about how the map talked about I gave I basically described the map of the impact that has that China's retaliatory tariffs have had on us as a nation and it and it clearly affected the big Trump congressional districts that he won overwhelmingly by about uh, 70 60 70 percent that's where tariffs were from China were a massive influence so it seems like the tariffs will come down. And the U.S. will postpone plans to increase tariffs on $200 billion in Chinese goods and the two sides entering negotiations on other contentious issues. That's from the Wall Street Journal today. Trump is also tweeting about it uh, this morning about how the negotiation is going. I'm trying to get it up right now. He said, quote, we would, um, oh yeah, I am certain that at some time in the future, President Xi and I together with, the, with President Putin of Russia We'll start talking about a meaningful halt to what has been a major arms race. The U.S. spent $716 billion this year. Crazy. Goes on to talk about the relationship with him and she. Um, it looks like the markets had a pretty positive, pretty positive day. The Dow was up about 287 points. S&P 500 thir up 30. And the NASDAQ up 110. Both up about a percent. So that's good for the, for the day. I mean, that's that's... That I can anyone can tell you that's that's in response to what happened over the weekend. It looks like a successful G20 if the tariffs can come down. Now I'm not for tariffs, but I I think it would be, it's a good step right now to uh, work through those negotiations. I get what Trump's doing here. Trump's just trying to get him to the table and work out a tariff deal or work out um, getting the getting the trade deficit uh, balanced because we've had one for decades. Recent decades, I should say, not not a whole not a whole lot of years, maybe 30, 40 years of, of big trade deficits that we've never addressed, and Trump is doing it. But tariffs, I don't know if that's the answer. As I said, I'm as you could tell, probably tell from last week's program, I am not a fan of tariffs per se. But it is it is important that that we recognize the facts as far as who tariffs affect. <clears throat> it is when you look at, I'll say it again, the map. Uh, from the New York Times that, that shows the impact of China retaliatory tariffs. That's huge. And that's, that, that's partially, and as I said, that's partially why the Republicans could have lost that midterms. It's very well possible. Now you have to get deep down in the districts and, and who was the congressman here, who was the congressman there, that lost here. It's, you can get into all of that, but it's, it's part of the reason. And people don't like, it looks like a majority of the people don't like tariffs, I'd assume. It's risky. It's a big risk. And it's one that many conservatives are not a fan of, and liberals, eh, they're, they're kind of okay with it. It's not, it's a, it's a, but the over, overwhelming, I think a good majority of the country is not a fan of tariffs. That's fair to say. 
um, because it's a risk, as I said. So now, down south of the border, tariffs are still on Mexico because we still have we, – we, we finished a trade deal with Mexico. Still have to get approved by Congress, of course, because this is the bilateral – or the, sorry, the trilateral – I guess the, the deal with Canada and Mexico that we got into. <clears throat> this way, we keep the tariffs on because the trade deal is finished, but now there's a caravan coming. So we got to keep the pressure on Mexico. That is the whole reason why the tariffs are on. And they just got a new uh, president, a socialist, so to speak, from, from what I read. Haven't really looked into him, but that's what the reports are. His name is Andreas Manuel. He is the new president. He just got in on Saturday of Mexico. He had, an, I think, an overwhelming victory, and he will succeed Enrique Nieto. Trump supported uh, him this morning with an endorsement. Congratulations to newly inaugurated Mexican president. He will have a tremendous political victory with the great support of the Mexican people. We will work together for many years to come. Optimistic, but it's a tweet. Now he's now he's he's talking about he's talking about things like the caravan. He wants to get that solved. I think I think every American wants to solve the caravan problem in one way or another. Whether you want to take them all in or whether you want the military to stop them all. There's one there's a few ways to go about it. Caravan still, you know, there's there's people now coming in. And slowly, by the hundreds, it's not by thousands, but it's by the hundreds right now. It's, it's gradual, but it's still, we still can't spec. I don't want to speculate yet on what will happen because I've been wrong before on that. So it's still, it's still tough to look at. Also, Michael Avenatti, if you've been reading in the news, he's gone through a tough month. I guess, I guess it's safe to say he's had a pretty tough November, has he not? He's, if you don't remember, he is the lawyer to the porn star Stormy Daniels who is who just who just had that lawsuit against the president it just got thrown out of court in California and now Stormy Daniels owes the president I think about three hundred thousand dollars or something like it in legal fees but anyway uh, here's what political Politico uh, reported quote Michael Avenatti's cable TV book is a dwindled he is uninvited from one prominent Democratic event and skipped out on another he has even publicly clashed with his highest profile client so, in this case, uh, Stormy Daniels has accused him, I'm trying to remember, it was, it was something, as a Stormy Daniels was accusing him of, of, not, of pursuing a lawsuit that she did not want invo uh, involvement in, but this is, here's what, I think this is it, yeah, well she, uh, no, that's not it, actually wait, no, she said, for months, I've asked Michael Avenatti to give me accounting information on the, on, about the funds my supporters so generously donated for my safety and legal defense. He has repeatedly ignored those requests. Days ago, I demanded again repeatedly that he tell me how the money was being spent and how, money, how much was left. Instead of answering me without my permission or even my knowledge, Michael launched another crowdfunding campaign to raise money on my behalf. So there's, there's a little conflict now. <laughs> Stormy Daniels is, uh, I think, yeah, she's paid... Avenatti told Political that um, Stormy Daniels had paid $100 for legal cost. It will probably exceed about a little over a million and a half dollars. And uh, but the case will get thrown out of court. It already has actually in LA. So they still owe the president's legal team money, which is we'll see what happens. Avenatti also the other part, the other damaging part to Avenatti. This wasn't even the worst part. Avenatti got accused of domestic violence and was taken to to prison for a couple nights and that was that was tough for him because now the public looks at him as you know someone who's who's beaten his wife I guess I don't, I don't know but and then you look at him and you look at how the Democrats are campaigning now and you say and now we're starting a campaign on believing sexual assault sexual assault survivors um, then then you got Avenatti who's and, and this is ironic because Avenatti is going through going through this right now where do you want to believe the woman or do you want to believe him? The Democrats have to make a choice on him now because he's been very vocal about does he want to run in the Democrat primary? He's been very, you know, upfront. He's been talking about policy. He's been talking about he's already enacted a campaign team. He's got he's he's funded. He's got the money. That's not an issue too much. But he's he's quite a character. And if he runs He's going to have to answer those questions, and he's going to have to have prepared answers for that, because this he got a big blow this week 
or this month rather from from that now he's now he's going after everybody who accuses him on Twitter uh, of or people who are accusing him of of uh, domestic violence. He's he's going on Twitter and actually people who criticize him basically. He's going after people. So like he he got into a big spat with a bunch of people actually. There's too many to name. He tweets very he tweets very frequently and he replies to almost every high profile person who criticizes him. It's almost like he's watching TV every single day. <laughs> every single second of the day. But he's he's going to come back on the scene, I think, and he says that his approval would, it would only be better. I'm still shocked by that, but I don't I don't believe that's true. I mean, the Democrats have to make a choice on him. I don't even think Michael Avenatti is progressive enough to win that primary. I don't think so. I don't think he's the right guy to win that primary for the Democrats. I think you still want to run a guy like Biden or, or Bernie Sanders just purely because they're they've got more experience. Michael Avenatti already has flaws on him, as opposed to Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders who have legislative accomplishments as as democrats so they might be a little bit more experienced in that in that in in that primary so i don't know if michael avenatti would still want to run but i mean he certainly can it's, it's a it's a free country but will he run is another question now he got into a big spat with uh chris saliza of cnn where he published an article from the very one i'm reading from of from politico he said the end of Avenatti, and Avenatti saying Chris hasn't has, Chris hasn't kept up in three years, and don't expect anything anything to change this cycle because he's still sleeping. I'll never forget he's repeated abysmal predictions from 2015-16. This is quite amusing because these are people that all can't stand Donald Trump. They all predicted he would lose in 2016. This is the same stuff, same people, and now they're basically going back and forth with each other. And Michael Avenatti being the provocateur in all of this. And Michael Avenatti, if you recall, is not the only one considering running for public office. You have people like Jeff Zucker of CNN, who has actually said that he is interested now in running for office. And Jeff Zucker is obviously the guy who runs CNN almost across the board, I think. And he's very interested in politics, he says, and he wants to run. I think he, I guess, I assume he'd run as a Democrat. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know any other way he'd, he'd run. But that would be quite something because now he's got the whole media war with the president that he can surely run on democrats appeal look at that and say oh i I believe you yeah you're the victim yeah it's fine i mean he can run but but he runs cnn but then that would question if i'm looking at it from a critical standpoint cnn is a news outlet so if a if the leader of the news outlet runs as a democrat doesn't that doesn't that confirm their bias wouldn't that confirm a bias in someone's head? The average person who watches Jeff Zucker on the debate stage, if he were to go up there, then to say, okay, now, wait, doesn't he run CNN? What's he doing on the debate stage? I thought CNN was supposed to be uh, independent and everything, right? I mean, it's not like... It, it, Jeff Zucker, if he were to run, it's it's a little different than Michael Avenatti. Like, Jeff, well, we all know Jeff Zucker's a Democrat, but because he is a registered Democrat. But... If the average person were to watch that debate and say, the average independent, say, well, he worked for CNN. He should be non. He should be independent at least. At least, com- at least, disguise as independent. Mm, maybe not. All right. Moving on from the campaign. I know it's a lot. I, I went. If you remember last week, I talked about uh, a good amount. I, I actually spent a whole segment talking about the potential candidates for 2020 and who could actually have a shot against the president. So now. Rand Paul has actually been under attack now for blocking pro-Israel bills. This is this is kind of shocking to me because everyone, every Republican really supported the president and the whole Israel moving the embassy from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, or I'm sorry, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So I don't, I don't know where, I don't know where Rand Paul's getting this idea that he can block these bills and not, <laughs> not get backlash for it. Perhaps he's trying to negotiate with something. They're all Israel-related, apparently, and it gives uh, funding to, to the to the country. Um, the measure has broad bi- bipartisan support in Congress, and various versions of the bill have easily passed the Senate and the House in recent months. But the Senate, the Senate still needs to pass a final version. Still have not heard why he, 
is necessarily blocking this. Although, yeah, the the it's that yeah, the Politico's reporting that his office is slow to respond to this. Um, that's shocking to me because you know Republicans are, are very pro-Israel. Some Democrats, a lot of Democrats are too. But there are there are some who aren't. And I'm going to name one right now. He got fired from CNN, speaking of CNN, last week. Mark Lamont Hill. And this brings up a whole entire free speech debate that people could have. Mark Lamont Hill made some comments about, about Israel and Palestine. And he claims he was criticizing the Israeli government. And he basically, he basically went, went after Israel. And, and he criticized that government tremendously. And he says... And then he says, uh, the, the goal is a free Palestine, he says, quote. And, you know, he got fired immediately because of, of major backlash. Yeah, he called, for, he called for a free Palestine, quote, from the river to the sea. So CNN fired him basically the next day. Now, now this brings up the even further debate. Is it, is it about free speech? Because if you remember it correctly, I don't think he was implying death. But at the same time, hate speech is protected under the First Amendment. But also, the company can can fire CNN, can fire whoever they they please. It's a pri it's a it's a private company. But at the same time, do you fire someone for making comments like that or having an opinion like that? I remember the Blaze got this controversy. No, not quite. Well, it's a it's a heated topic, the same. But the Blaze, the Blaze got had this controversy when Tommy Lahren got fired for being pro-choice, and Glenn Beck, because she she said on the View she she confirmed that she's pro-choice, and Glenn Beck fired her a week later, and and then she filed a lawsuit against the Blaze saying because of my my pro-choice view that you fired me, and then she eventually won the lawsuit, and this controversy is something not new, but. For having an opinion, no matter what you think of it, if, you know I personally disagree with it, but that's fine. My view, my view on this is irrelevant. But is it? Does he have the right to say that and still be employed? My opinion is yes. I don't agree with his opinion, but it's free speech. If it's under the First Amendment, which it is, he's not he's not inciting killing anybody. From what I, I heard. He, yeah, he, I'll, to reiterate, he said, quote, We have an opportunity to not just offer solidarity in words, but to commit to political action, grassroots action, local action, and international action that will give us what justice requires. And that is a free Palestine from the river to the sea. Now, you can make the argument that the, quote, river to the sea phrase is code for the destruction of Israel. Hamas uses this term. That's, and that can be a dog whistle, I guess. I don't know. To, to Palestinians, I don't, I don't know. I, I think the best of people. So I don't, I don't think he was inciting killing people. But then I saw, then I saw on Twitter, a couple, uh, literally a day after he got fired from CNN, there's a picture of him next to Louis Farrakhan, who is a, who is a very who is definitely anti-Semitic. He's tweeted a lot of things like that. You can go on his Twitter profile. I don't need to read his quotes. But he, read, he said something about, um, I'm, I'm anti-termite, and I'm not anti-Semite, I'm anti-termite, and things like that. <clears throat> that's, who, that's who Mark Lamont Hill was posed with a couple days after he got fired. Well, the picture came out a couple days after he was fired from CNN. But now, should he be fired? And we still, this all comes back to, does he have the right to say it? And shouldn't he stay with the company because of his opinion? Again, I still say yes. Because he's not... You can make the argument that he's implying violence, but really, is... But is he... Yeah, my opinion would be if he, if he wanted to make a bigger statement about critiquing Israel, if, if he wanted to in, incite death on the Israelis, I think he'd go about it in a more different way and not in that... In that um, scenario that he was in, giving that speech. He, he goes on to say in that speech, saying, quote, I support Palestinian freedom. I support Palestinian self-determination. 
adding, I do not support anti-Semitism, killing Jewish people, or any of the other things attributed to my speech. He said that on Twitter the day after uh, the speech came out and he got the backlash. So I'll let you have that debate. I'm, I'm currently, I am, I am dead in the middle on this, whether he, whether he should stay with CNN or not. I, I don't endorse the decision, nor do I object to it. I don't, I don't know, but that's a, I found Joe Scarborough's tweet right here. He says, quote, Trump's campaign colluded with Russia, wrote Charles Krauthammer. Quote, his defense is pathetic for two reasons. First, have the Trumpites not been telling us for six months that no collusion ever happened, and now they say, sure, it happened, so what? That was the headline talking about the Washington Post article. Uh, that the last, I think it was one of the last ones, or no, I think it was a, a one, that Char one that Charles Krauthammer wrote that was... Uh, a year or two before his death. So this was tweeted, just to give you some context, this was tweeted the day after, literally the day after Krauthammer passed away. Again, I ask, what what motives do you do you have for that? Where do you, what do you think? Like you wake up in the morning, you think, you think, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to tweet about him, but yeah, I'm going to use this as my political advantage. That's terrible. And it shows that politics is too personal for some of these people. And it occurs on the opposite side, it seems like. It's sickening. But anyway, getting back to trade, what I wanted to talk about. Uh, Trump, as I mentioned in the beginning, Trump and uh, President Xi worked on, on a negotiation and a, and a truce to not raise tariffs. China has agreed not to raise tariffs on our cars, on, on the cars coming into China. So this way... Um, here's what it says in the Wall Street Journal. After a weekend dinner between Messrs. Trump and Trump and Trump and President Xi at a group of uh, a group of 20 summit in Argentina, the U.S. P uh, postponed its threat to increase tariffs on 200 billion dollars in Chinese goods to 25 percent from 10 percent. But it set a timeline of only about three months from the two sides to negotiate several issues that have proved largely intractable in the past. This sounds all of a sudden optimistic now. I get I get back to what I was talking about in the first segment. So, do you you know, I I do I do I do seem optimistic about this. I am, because if these tariffs can help, if they are, I mean if these tariffs can help solve the trade imbalance, that's great. But how do how do the people recover? Talk about the Midwest. I talked about the chart. And I, if, again, if you want to go find it on the New York Times, I'll give you the headline again. It was something related to, and no, never mind, I'll get it later. But, and the, also the Wall Street Journal is reporting, is reporting about the uh, Khashoggi, the, the whole Khashoggi thing and how it went down. Basically what happened was Jamal Khashoggi was killed by, by the investigation shows, basically by the Wall Street, um, the Wall Street Journal taken from the CIA, that Jamal Khashoggi was was likely killed, likely killed. But Khashoggi, yet yeah, it's interesting. Khashoggi has a lot of communication with the people involved. I'm sorry, why am I saying Khashoggi? Um, the the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia has a lot of communication with with the people involved in killing uh, Jamal Khashoggi. So obviously, he knew about it. He must have. There were electronic messages sent, all of this stuff, and I and it's reported that Khashoggi was going to the to the embassy to simply seek for immigration status from to the United States to to get immigration uh, to to become to become United States citizen, so to speak. He was trying to, at least, but the content of the messages isn't known between the Crown Prince and one of the uh, one of the men. Here's here's how it breaks down. I can't pronounce this guy's name. Mr. Um, Katani, Katani, I guess, one of the supervisors in the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, and it was a 15-man team. This guy had had communication with the Crown Prince, and that's where that alone makes me think the Crown Prince at least knew, which is why we should condemn Saudi Arabia for this, and why I still think it was wrong for the president to 
why I still think the president was wrong in his statement. So I want to make that clear. Because there's clear communication now. CIA has the has the documents and the proof and everything, but they're, it can't be conclusive. I mean, that's obvious. Why it can't? We don't we don't know without we don't know con, we don't know conclusively that it is quite true. So we have yet to find out more. But I assume we're gonna we're gonna learn very shortly within the coming weeks because this is a big investigation. So I, I uh, am curious to find that out, but it's not, it is, again, it's not definite. It's likely. All right. That wraps up the show for today. Next week, again, the news cycle always changes. So next week, hopefully it's a little bit more positive than, um, than passings of former presidents and uh, rest in peace to George H.W. Bush. And, um, and I feel sorry for the uh, Bush family. So um, I would like to uh, wish you a happy Monday and have a great week, everybody. The Michelin Man Experience is up next. Have a great one, everybody. You're listening to 1077 The Bronx and 1077thebronc.com.